The subject is building for a climate emergency. Now we've had this situation, uh, the, the carbon decarbonization is becoming a very hot topic. It's uh, such a hot topic that uh, globally we're having problems discussing it and also on a national basis it becomes a very hot topic and uh, it's, it's very, very difficult to get agreement and movement. But what we've seen is that we've seen these smart cities uh, actually declare a climate emergency and uh, we've seen minor cities and major cities do this. They feel that this carbon decarbonization is important for way of life within the cities and just basically is starting to redefine and there is a cost uh, associated with carbon and so they're starting to reformat uh, their cities and I really applaud this movement it's uh, it's really taking us in a different direction it gives us a new uh, a new business model which uh, uh, Brad is going to talk about I'm just it's kind of a, an amazing kind of a direction change for us. But as the cities start to declare a climate emergency, that then passes on to our buildings and we then have to start changing our buildings uh, for this climate emergency. And the, the most obvious uh, trend that involves is basically moving away from gas-fired, oil-fired boilers and moving to electricity as generally electricity is, uh, is carbon free in some areas of the town. We're, uh, Brad and I are kind of from an unusual uh, piece of the country. We're from British Columbia, where in fact, uh, almost all of our energy is generated with hydro. It's all just water over a dam. So uh, we are definitely carbon free if we go to electric. Uh, less and less that, uh, that gets dis sprinkled across America but we're starting to see California uh, with wind and uh, um, solar, they're getting more and more of it that is uh, non-carbon based. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, just chat a little bit about some of the big trends that are going on in the world. Probably the biggest one that's right uh, in our faces right now is these bush fires in Australia. We have of a large portion of Australia that is under under fire and uh, last year we burned up a good portion of California uh, in our carbon calculations I'm not sure that we that we included those and that's an awful lot of CO2 released into the air it's a significant kind of, uh, of a phenomena that's that is occurring we also have uh, Greta telling us that uh, you know, we have to address our problem and she's getting a lot of press because her answers or questions are, are very pointed and very logical and uh, it's interesting to see uh, how, a, how a young girl can change the world so very impressed with all of that. We certainly have a situation where the ice caps are melting we can physically see that we can see the water rising <clears throat> and we see CO2 rising as well from historical values. These are all trends that are, uh, you know, having us question and actually create and declare a climate emergency. Uh, the fact that the, the you know, the, the, uh, the glaciers are, are uh, diminishing, actually one of the situations that some of these things are interconnected, the bushfires in Australia uh, the, uh, the soot and ash blew over and stuck on the glaciers in New Zealand and uh, so they were melting even faster than they normally were. We have rising water uh, uh, around the world. Uh, I think most uh, in the news was Vienna. Uh, that's not right. Yeah, anyway. The, uh, you know, just we're starting to see the sea level rising. It's starting to cause all kinds of problems. When we try to take a look at that on a global map, we see that the, uh, these rising water things move up the rivers and we see all kinds of situations. I don't know if you've seen the, uh, the video that, uh, or the portrait of actually every level of sea level and you see 
basically pieces of our country turning into islands. Smart grid is another uh, situation that uh, we more and more we we want to know where that energy is coming from. Is it basically generated with carbon, or has it generated by wind or is it renewable? We're also looking more at microgrids, buildings interacting. All of this starts to fall into uh, the building. The smart grid, uh, we've, we're kind of in, we've got concerns. We basically have gone into nuclear. We're, we've gone out of nuclear. Uh, n nuclear is at least carbon free. It creates its own problems, but it, it is uh, a portion that allows some of, the, uh, some of the country to actually move to a more carbon free uh, future. But anyway, all of these things are interacting. We have the electric car phenomena, which allows us to store energy, which gives us some other options. Uh, we're starting to see where we can actually move electrical power, which we've not been able to do before, but with the electrical vehicle, we can take it from home and bring it to the office or take it from the office and bring it home. So uh, there's starting to be some uh, movement there that again is starting to affect our buildings. ASHRAE has come up with this smart grid application guide. Uh, they're starting to acknowledge the interaction of buildings with, uh, with the smart grid. Uh, they've been at it for a few years and we've got some people that have some experience with that. Obviously smart grid has to be part of our, uh, our offering uh, in building for a climate emergency. Okay, this next slide starts with uh, Casey. <clears throat> and Casey is with uh, Navigant and I'm gonna let her just tell you a little bit more about herself. Casey Talon. Hi. Thanks, Ken. Um, so I'm Casey Talon. I'm a research director with Navigant um, Market Research covering a whole ecosystem of technologies, and I lead our building innovations program. So we look at the trends around technology adoption across the commercial and residential sector primarily. Um, the reason that I'm a part of this conversation is that we've been exploring what does the future of the built environment look like uh, with this new low carbon future. Um, just some points here that underscore what Ken is talking about from in addition to the pressures of climate change, there are other aspects of globalization that are creating new opportunities for buildings in a low carbon future and leveraging technology. Um, we recognize there's this incredible growth in the, in the middle class, putting new pressure for technology like cooling in areas that have historically not had cooling. Um, urbanization, the movement into urban centers, um, obviously the climate impact and, and energy demands that we uh, that can already reference. This all comes together to put new pressure on the way in which our buildings operate, um, but also opportunity for us to demonstrate innovation and how that really can transform the way our buildings operate, how we experience our spaces. Um, and so when we talk about the evolution of the energy ecosystem at Navigant, we've been talking about what we call the energy cloud similar to the idea of the smart grid, but that really the relationship between energy supply and demand is being completely redefined. And that the historical sort of linear relationship between supply and demand is being upended by distributed energy resources, energy efficiency, and buildings have a great role to play if technology is adopted um, in, an, in an innovative way. Um, this, we're getting toward the future of what we envision, the pinnacle of the smart building really being building to grid, and that is the point at which every system within the building is efficient, high efficiency, um, it's connected, automated, um, and interacting not only with the systems um, across the sort of historic silos between heating, cooling, lighting, security, but also with any on-site resources like solar, um, EV storage, or batteries. That point at which those buildings become really dynamic resources, um, and they establish a new kind of value for building owners. So the, that, that vision of this building to grid has value not only for tackling climate change, um, dealing with the climate crisis, but also some really important financial benefits to building owners. Um, we think this, this development is already underway. There's certainly many um, illustrations of the evolution of the automation and controls industry, um, increasingly integrated systems, 
and a whole um, array of new business models to help customers overcome any of the capital burdens to employing some of these technologies. So while the vision is there, um, I think there's a long way to go in certain markets, but we're seeing some really strong potential from these smart building technologies. So what sort of the way we've envisioned this is a sort of value stacking that in, individually you'll see illustrations of some of these investments today, but in the aggregate they can create a powerful story for building owners. Um, there's the idea that you have this digital foundation, you're using data, and that's really a new currency. You've probably heard that line that data is the new currency in the new economy. In a built environment, um, that is really about understanding the way in which your systems operate and what that means for your bottom line. Um, it could be energy and operational efficiencies. Um, and also, increasingly, the focus on just the occupant experience, that depending on what your business is, your building can be a part of your brand. It could be a part of the way in which you attract and retain employees or customers, um, and that that is all um, part of the evolution of the market today. So this illustration here is just intending to show that as you deploy more of these technologies, the value of that building increases over time not only for the building owner, but also from the macro level um, opportunities around tackling the climate emergency, where the buildings then become a really dynamic uh, um, source to monitor and, and respond to, say, grid instability um, at, at, at these increasingly frequent um, uh, weather disruptions um, or heat waves, um, that they are um, the ability to actually supply um, energy and also just provide a whole data stream for, say, a smart cities application. So this is the schematic that we've been um, developing under the idea of the build, building to grin concept. One of the aspects of the, that we hear about a lot in our research is that um, a lot of the technology is pretty mature. It's been around. So what, what's the holdup? Why are we not seeing a plethora of smart buildings in every city? Um, and we recognize that there's a lot of challenges on the people side of the equation on both the supply side as well as demand side. Um, the requirements really are that there has to be sophisticated technologies, there's this process of integration, there has to be the right set of financial circumstances, ROI has to be proven, which can be um, difficult depending on how you start to frame these use cases. And then there's this whole process of who makes decisions um, and, and how those investments are made. Um, and what we recognize is that it really is a change in the way business is done. So on the top, we have this, these two buckets from the supply side. I think one of the big changes and something that you may see on the floor here is this pivot. So there's you know, major um, market incumbents and technology providers that have always had a product business model. They sell a thing, they go into a building owner, that building has a new HVAC system. At a certain point, it, there's a point of replacement. It's probably burnt out or it has significant problems. And then you revisit. There's a transition when you think about this idea of the smart building and building to grid, that it's a much more engaged, ongoing relationship. And that it's more about a solution play. So there's a, there's a complementary suite of hardware, software, and services. Because you have to get that data. You have to support those customers. I mean, that's a change in the way a lot of these companies have done business for maybe even hundreds of years. Um, from a process standpoint, w one of the underlying ideas with the smart building is that there's a convergence between IT and OT. So you're having a remotely accessible data streams and automation tied to your HVAC or lighting. It's a different set of skills um, that relies on understanding how those systems are networked from the data perspective as well challenges around the topics of cybersecurity um, and just that integration. And so that, again, brings together a set of challenges from a human capital perspective um, and marrying domain and technology expertise in different ways. So those changes have to come to play. We recognize that may be a matter of partnering. It could be a series of acquisitions um, or organic growth by hiring new skill sets. And that's all big questions for players in the market also leading to huge opportunities um, for the winner of this kind of profile, being able to engage customers in much more significant ways. On the demand side, this is also changing the way building and business owners think about their buildings. Um, they're, historically, these kinds of facility type investments may have been done very tactically you know, from a, a, a functional group. And when you start to think about the idea of a smart building strategy or building to grid, the conversation is really elevated to an executive perspective. It's much more strategic. That's changing the game as well, and it requires breaking down similar silos, 
between IT and, and facilities management, real estate, and even to the C-suite. So that's just sort of the way we've been um, hearing that the challenges are, are bubbling up while we don't see every building being smart um, and, and kind of the next steps to see more evolution in that market. And um, the idea that this is a huge opportunity. We've characterized this as the idea of a building to grid orchestrator. This could be the next generation service provider. But the idea that there is a process here um, to help customers through a journey, really, of transforming their facilities into building to grid assets, um, that they have to just like, deal with their legacy technologies and equipment, ensure that they're running in an optimal way. They may retrofit significant pieces, um, investment, and so on. And those are big questions, particularly for large portfolio owners. How do they start to set priorities, and how do they recognize what investment um, should happen, and what is the impact of those investments? So um, we think there's a, a, a burgeoning future of partnership, um, a new, much deeper relationships between some of these building owners, um, at least from a conceptual level. And finally, we think that the, we're really re reaching a point of urgency, um, underscoring the message around the climate emergency. There's also business implications suggesting that building owners get on, on this page now and that solution providers take advantage of this, um, that you could lose your customers, that sustainability is becoming um, table stakes, and that characterizing your business imperatives around sustainability is increasingly common, and your buildings can be a really important part of that story. It's a way of demonstrating in a very visual way in certain respects or from an experience perspective that you're making, you're making um, investments under not underlying your sustainability commitments. So that's uh, just a backdrop from our research ongoing um, into what we see as the future of the smart building and then beyond um, and some of the challenges that we hear that are limiting um, today, but hopefully with mounting momentum as it is a compounded issue because of the climate emergency. Great. Okay, thank you very much, Casey. That was great, and uh, I think that really sets the scene. And wh what we're going to do with this is then uh, Brad's going to come up, give his perspective on it, and then I'm going to want them to, uh, we're going to get them both involved in just some dialogue and some of the interaction. So Brad, do you want to come up sure. and your perception? Sure. Uh, thanks, Ken. Uh, so for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Brad White. I'm a consultant in Vancouver, Canada, and we do, our company specializes mainly in retrofits for commercial institutional buildings. Uh, we don't do very much new construction, mostly existing buildings. Um, and so what I've noticed in the last, I'd say starting two or three years ago, but really picking up in the last year, is that in our jurisdiction, um, more and more of our clients are now motivated more by the, the greenhouse gas reductions from our projects than they are by the cost savings. Um, and that's certainly not every project, but if I was to go back five, ten years, um, you know, hundred percent of our projects were driven by the cost savings. And that's not the case anymore. We've got more and more clients who prioritize the emissions reduction above and beyond the cost savings. Now, granted, a lot of these are public sector organizations that in British Columbia do have mandates for, for reducing climate, but some of them are private companies that, you know, as Casey just said, you know, they're realizing that there's a cost to their inaction and, you know, especially some of the big, you know, class A commercial office providers, they want to be ahead of the curve. They still want to be seen as leaders in the market. So they're starting to take this pretty seriously. And then add on to that, we've got jurisdictions like Vancouver that are effectively looking at banning uh, natural gas for heating plants um, in, in the not too distant future. So, you know, if you're doing, if you need a new boiler, well, guess what? You're not gonna be allowed to put a boiler in. You'll have to have electrified your, your building heating system. Um, now that's a pretty, I would say, pretty progressive, um, pretty. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know if extreme is the right word. If you know, if we accept that it is a climate emergency, then maybe no action is too extreme. But that, that's certainly among the more extreme measures that municipalities are taking. But even the ones that aren't going quite that far are looking really seriously, especially at their own portfolios, about you know what they can do to reduce the emissions. And so that's led to, you know, not us only looking at energy efficiency, but really looking seriously, okay, how do we transform these buildings in a, in a deeper manner? Like we can get, you know, 10, 20, maybe even 30% emissions reductions through efficiency. Um, 
But you know, we have clients wanting now 50, 80% reductions and wanting to know how they would get there. Um, and so now we're looking really seriously at you know, how do we electrify, uh, as you know, uh, Ken said, we, you know, we we're blessed with low carbon electricity. Well, so the answer is, okay, we have to electrify the building. We have to convert this building from natural gas to electrification. It's cost prohibitive generally to do that with you know, electric resistance. So you know, it, it really means heat pumps. We're looking at, okay, how do we apply heat pump technology? Both air to air, air to water, water to water heat pumps are you know, more and more of our projects are involving those technologies. Uh, and originally, I wasn't going to speak to slides, but I realized I've actually got an old presentation that, I, that actually speaks to this stuff perfectly. So if you bear with me for one second, I'm just going to pull up, um, pull up the, the, just to give you an example of some of the past projects um, that we've been working on that I think illustrate uh, you know, how significant the potential reductions are um, from some of these projects. So let's flip through the stuff that doesn't matter. Um, okay, so case studies. So uh, this is a, a building that we did in Vancouver. Um, you know, this building had the benefit of having a small data center inside it. I think one floor of the building is a data center, which previously they had a chiller running to get, reject that heat um, to through a cooling tower. Um, so anyway, we, we designed a heat recovery chiller system, which takes that heat and injects it back into the heating loop. Uh, and you know they're now saving 96% of the natural gas uh, in the building, and, and with a, a pretty good payback. Um, now that's that's kind of an ideal situation, and, and certainly not every building has that kind of situation. But there's been other like this is a shopping mall. Um, you know they were able to t take natural gas down by 65%, uh, reduce their emissions by a third. This is just another little office building. They took both gas and electricity down significantly when they replaced an out of date chiller and boiler, uh, the, you know, the chiller that was an energy hog. Um, so we're actually running the chiller more than we used to be, but because it's a more efficient piece of equipment, we've saved both gas and electricity. Um, and you can see that the change in the monthly gas consumption after we, we, we turned on and commissioned that piece of equipment. Um, now those are, I would say, some of the, you know, the low hanging fruit, and there's a lot of that out there. Um, with you know doing heat recovery chillers and actually recovering what do I do recovering heat from within the building but you know we're also looking at more you know air to water systems which you know granted don't have quite as a good business case and that's where we get into having to educate clients on how to think about these projects a little differently um, because unfortunately we can't talk in payback terms the same way we can with energy efficiency you know the investment in an air to water heat pump it's going to cost you more to operate. You are not saving operational dollars the same way you are with energy efficiency. So now we have to speak a new language that you know we're looking at uh, you know cost per ton of emissions saved and comparing projects, different projects on you know what's the most cost effective way to mitigate the carbon emissions, um, and that being a better way to compare and evaluate these projects than looking at a payback because you know in a lot of cases as I said they, they actually cost more to operate or you know you've got a payback that's in the hundreds of years and, and so that's not the reason to do the projects the reason is because for some other for some other reason the the organization has decided that, that uh, emissions reductions are are a priority um, and I think you know the other thing that we're seeing is clients um, that are looking at I think uh, as Casey mentioned you know areas that don't have have historically not put a lot of mechanical cooling in the buildings, realizing that they suddenly need it. And we've got one client, they're a small university, uh, and they've got a lot of buildings. They, you know, they didn't used to operate as much in the summer, and, and now you know, more and more they're a year-round operation, and you know, they've got a lot of buildings that are, are overheating in the summer. And so they're looking at investing in, in you know, new chillers and, and things like that for their buildings. But then you know, they're also aware that you know, the projections for climate of Vancouver that have been done show the, a significant increase in the cooling degree days over the next 20 years uh, and I think losing about a third of our heating degree days. Um, that's over the next 20 to 30 years. And if they're looking at buying a new chiller, well that, that equipment reasonably is going to last 25 to 30 years. Um, so they want to start taking climate change projections into account when we're designing this new equipment. Uh, and so that's interesting. That's so now we're we're wrestling with, uh, you know, how do we figure out what these buildings are going to look like 
in a different climate regime. So now we're looking at, okay, how do we, how do we model space temperatures based on climactic conditions? And is there a way that we can do that, that we can run different scenarios and evaluate, evaluate what the performance of these buildings is, is gonna look like on, under different conditions? And so that's a really interesting exercise. Um, to, to walk through and, and, and to kind of wrap our heads around it. And, and you know, what the results of that being is, like, yeah, they're going to need a lot more cooling than we need today, and, and you know, we've got to have a plan for dealing with that because if we put a chiller in now, you know, they're not, yeah, yes, we could probably add another chiller, um, you know, 20 years from now if we had to, um, but, it, you know, is there a way that we can design for that up front? Uh, and then I guess tying this all back to smart buildings is, you know, these buildings that we are converting, if we're converting from running on 180 degree water to running on 140 degree water, you're not going to achieve that in a dumb building. You need to have excellent smart building controls. You need to have your building running like a top to reduce the heating demand as much as possible, to make sure you've got, you know, good control on, on your hydronic system. You've got, you know, you're not putting heat into zones that don't need it. So maybe you've incorporated um, occupant services and um, you know other ways of detecting occupancy so that you're you're keeping a really tight control on that. And so you're not, you know, the smart building piece is a really important part of, of all of this because you know you're not going to be able to achieve that conversion to a low carbon building without having you know smart building equipment. And only then, once your buildings have you know, that kind of level of smarts, you know, then you can think about, okay, we can, we can install a heat pump and be reasonably confident that we're actually going to be able to operate the building and not lose it on the first cold day. And so those are some of the challenges that we're facing. But I guess the overall message that I want to leave is that, you know, we, we have clients who are investing serious money in tackling their, their organizational climate em emissions. And I think more than anything else, there's enormous opportunity there, you know, not only for us as consultants, but for the equipment providers, for the contractors, for the folks that are going to, de you know, design, install, and maintain this equipment. Uh, I mean, I don't really care what your political position on climate change is. There, you know, I think there's going to be a tremendous amount of money to be made, quite frankly, in providing the solutions <laughs> to help buildings adapt, uh, adapt and respond to climate change. Because uh, we're going to have organizations that are looking at spending tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars and, and um, to, to tackle this problem. Uh, and I think, you know, our industry has the solutions. And so we should be at, at the forefront advocating for them and, and offering them. And that's it. I think you have one more slide there. Um, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Oh yeah, Vancouver, yeah. So this is what I, sorry, I didn't realize it was a slide there. Um, so this is, yeah, on Vancouver's climate emergency response. Highlighted. This is one of the sort of the six big steps, and it's you know zero emission space and water heating. So they're targeting by 2025, which is not very far away, all new and replacement heating and hot water systems will be zero emissions. And, and I think it's really the existing buildings where there's the biggest challenge. Um, in you know a new building, you know there's design solutions to make a new building zero emission. That's in this day and age. That's not that much of a stretch. It may be not conventional yet, but you know that that's well established how to do that. That's I think Vancouver's response to their climate emergency, yeah. correct? That's right. Yeah, to the climate emergency declaration. These are the things that they're proposing to do as a as a city, and, and you know a lot of it is transportation focused because that's where the bulk of the emissions are. Um, but you know the one that affects our industry is really looking at yeah zero emission space and water heating and it's going to be the existing buildings and i already have clients coming to me and say well, how do we do that in this building and so then you know we have to step through an exercise of actually looking at okay what would it take to make this building zero emission and, and that solution is going to look a little bit different in, in every existing building you know do some some buildings adapt quite quite well to low temperature water and, and some don't um and so the ones that don't you know uh, straightforward air to water heat pump conversion is not going to be enough. You're going to have to look at other things. Um, so anyway, it's an interesting problem and I think you know, there's a lot, of, lo a lot of opportunity in providing these solutions. So. When your picture reminds me, I, I pointed out that we were burning up Australia and we burned up California, but we actually burned up BC. What yeah, this is Vancouver in the summer, a bright sunny summer's day two years ago. Yeah. Uh, we spent Ha more than half the summer under that kind of smoke and, and um, you know, that, I mean, that actually brings up a whole other list of problems in terms of 
adaptation is you know, now we've got clients asking us about, you know, we don't have enough filtering on our equipment. We had to shut down our air handling units because they were bringing smoke into the building. So it's, uh, there's a whole bunch of issues that it brings up that, uh, that, that we can provide solutions to. That's all I had to say. Okay, great, great job, guys. That's uh, that's sort of put some of the parameters. Is there any questions from the audience? Anybody like to to make any observations? Yes. I'd like to jump up real quick. Good. I heard Brad say he's working mostly with existing buildings, which of course is important. But I realized not too long ago that there's a big problem with the embedded carbon impact uh -huh. the embodied energy selecting construction materials can affect the you can read that one it says low, low carbon uh, low carbon construction right. is another one that, that Vancouver is has high, you're right you're absolutely right, right because yeah. just choosing one concrete versus another can change the life cycle of the the carbon going into a building you could use more you could emit more carbon constructing a building than that building will use in its lifetime Mm -hmm. with a poor choice of materials, and most of them use a poor choice of materials. So there's another huge area for people of your expertise to get involved. That's, that's correct, and another one that came up that was kind of surprising is the whole excavation uh, process is to, to basically, when you want to excavate for a large building, you have to haul all of this land stuff out of town, and, and if in fact you can reutilize it within the city. Uh, we have a situation in our small town where they built a large building and they actually took all of the, uh, the fill and put it in front of the building and basically created a park. Uh, and uh, so the, the carbon saving in that of not having, plus it, we did not have big trucks rumbling through the small city and you know, so just innovative ideas like that uh, are extremely important. Any other observations? Yes, Mr. Remington. Uh, and I presented three or four slide decks at SRA and a couple of the association of engineers. And we all present, we talk about value stacking. You just speak up. Um, the value stacking piece is real. I mean, if you do an energy retrofit, you're going to save on some consumption, nice line item. You might impact the demand charge, really nice line item, it's easy to manage. Um, Economically monetizing the line item called sustainability and altering the carbon. I mean, it's real, but if you guys found a, a, a useful way to, to apply the dollar economics to the value stack for the overall value proposition for any of these projects, because that's where I get stumped. I, I can describe it all day long, but I can't put a dollar figure to it. And at the end of the day, the board says thou shalt, therefore you should. But then they also push back when they show them the price tag. So it's like tension there. So I've, as I said, I've started to use um, kind of a life cycle cost. So taking like a net present value or a total life cycle cost or savings. So you take the capital cost, you take all the, the incremental cost or savings over the life of the project. And I've kind of taken that, normalized it by the carbon emissions. So you get kind of a cost per ton, and it's a bit of an abstract value, and I think it, it's, but I do find it useful in comparing alternatives, because now we can, we can look at, well, okay, if you just invest in efficiency, or you do efficiency plus heat pumps and other things, if you only are really looking, especially if you're trying to make a decision around carbon mitigation, and you can get start to get a pretty good sense of which options. I mean, I'm, you know, recent example we're doing this analysis for looking at alternatives around domestic hot water system in the building. Okay, we're going to upgrade to that. They want to decarbonize it. Well, we've got, you know, a few different options that we can choose from. A few different technologies. You know, some are 200 bucks a ton life cycle. Some are 600 bucks a ton life cycle. Even though you know the capital cost might have told you something different, so at least then it says okay, you know for your mitigation cost lifetime, you have a clear winner that that is the way to go. Um, so it, it tells you something and allows you to compare. I don't know that it necessarily does a good job of kind of that full encapsulation of all the different things, but at a minimum, 
if by some means to use a, a, a real objective number to start to make some of these decisions. And to start, and I think the other piece is just an education piece for clients around how much this actually costs. Like, I still have some clients who are like, oh, you know, I'll pay a little bit. You know, can you save me, you know, half the, I want to reduce my emissions, but I'm only willing to spend, you know, 20% more than I otherwise would spend. Like, well, that's actually not, like, that's not going to really get you very far. Like, that, that would get you a little bit, but you really have to totally change your thinking and either put a price on carbon, and I'm not talking like 20, 30 bucks a ton, I'm, I'm talking like, you know, the city of Vancouver, for their internal decision making, is now using $150 a ton for carbon. Uh, there's another local, municip local municipality that's doing something similar, I think it's the same number, 150 bucks a ton. Um, it, it requires a pretty big change in the thinking, um, and you know, I, I, I've got clients that are, are not ready to go there, and I know they're not the ones that I'll, I'll be pushing on that, but you know, there's a few that are, and those ones, yeah, we can have a conversation about, okay, what, how much are you willing to pay for mitigation, um, and you know, find the alternatives that fit that. Thank you. Good day, you put on that, Casey, or are you happy? quantifying the full ROI. And I think there's a lot of conversation from a qualitative standpoint around how some of these smart technologies improve the experience, they improve productivity, they improve um, perception, which is obviously really hard to correlate, but there's no one-to-one -one relationship between productivity and me not being cold at my desk. But um, what we hear, and which I think is, is part of the reason that this is not fully mainstream adoption of all of these technologies in the aggregate, but what we do here is that for the companies that are having aggressive corporate sustainability initiatives, when the use cases, the narrative is cohesive in that you say you will have this efficiency, uh, both energy and operational efficiency, that's a hard number, but on top of that, these languages such that aligns with their goals, which may vary for a healthcare provider versus a higher ed or commercial office, that it starts to bring the right people to the table, and that once those people at the table um, that's changing the conversation. And so that's, it's not a very explicit um, number by any means and why I think it's not really mainstream. But that, that storyline and that, that sort of um, value proposition, I think, is becoming more cohesive. Yeah, I, I think that the, the notion that we're beginning to have these conversations is in and of itself forward motion from where we work. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't do business development, I'm a tech guy, but once in a while they listen to me in the lab. Mm -hmm. I said, look, I said, put together a, a once a month, if you're going to spend money advertising to promote your brand, by the way, add a sentence in sustainability, you know, and then that way you're tooting your horn. It's hard to quantify the money, but the value proposition is intangible, but it's present. It, it is one example. Yeah. Uh, thank you both. Okay, well I think I don't think there's any secret why we're so heavily vested in carbon. I mean it is definitely the lowest, the apparent lowest cost, but now we're starting to rethink is it really the lowest cost if if it does bring us to a an end before our end. So I mean that's sort of the discussion that's on the table and uh, uh, yeah there's there's no doubt that carbon is probably, in most cases, the, the lowest cost uh, solution. So it, this is not, we're not doing it on, the, on that cost, we're doing it on a basically a, a, return, a return on investment on their planet, I guess. <laughs> What's the ROI on our planet? <laughs> Anybody else want to uh, jump into the fray? It's an interesting conversation. Go. You want to respond to that, anyone? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think there's the commercial peace programs are available. I also think that there's a lot of discussion around energy and service and alternatives where, particularly one thing we're hearing is that this is increasingly valuable for those customers that are ready to make a more comprehensive engagement. Um, it can take away that capital burden, but also some of the responsibility, particularly when you start to roll in some of the smarts, the issues around, you know, could you potentially do a network as a service layered on with some of the efficiency? So, I think the as a service model is starting to bleed in um, as one example, but there's a few very high profile examples with very uh, forward thinking large customers. So I think it's a little bit early days, but I think it's a pretty uh, impressive model that's, that's being discussed. Not an evolution from the performance contract, but the similar 
I focus on the most right way. Great. Yeah. Uh, uh, we don't see a lot of it in jurisdictions that I do most sort of work in, so it's it's not something that we run into. But I think you know the green financing. I mean, there's lots of different models out there. I think, yeah, it's still pretty early days, but you know I think it should be potential to be there. Um, I think the I think the other thing I was going to mention that I don't know if I, I fully wrapped my head, sort of brought the point up, but um, you know around cl climate adaptation in buildings is often an opportunity for mitigation. So you know, when we're doing this work on buildings that don't have enough cooling, that's a great opportunity for us to suggest a heat pump because you know, basically the same technology, it's a little more expensive. Um, you've got to do you know, some extra stuff. But if you're already invested in adding, adding cooling, you know, it's not that much more of an investment to then you know, spend the money to knock off half the building's emissions. Um, so it's really like looking for these opportunities and uh, educating clients to understand that you know, when they're doing capital, capital renewal, that that is really the time to think about you know, low carbon technologies. Um, and, and to think about that ahead of time so that when you're, you know, your equipment goes belly up, that you're not just rushing on buying like for like replacement, that you've actually thought through kind of the low carbon plan for this building and know that, okay, yeah, this is now the right time to pull the trigger on that heat recovery chiller or that air source heat pump or you know, whatever the technology that, that determines right for the building. I think the other thing is the technology is changing really fast right now. Um, you know, carbon dioxide heat pumps are an example of, of a relatively new technology. It's been, you know, it's been common in Japan for quite a while. It's relatively new in the North American market. There aren't that many products available yet. Um, but it solves a bunch of problems because it, it you know, carbon dioxide heat pumps, I mean, A, the refrigerant is a lot more friendly to the climate. Um, but B, you know, it can put out pretty hot temperature water. Uh, now there's some other design changes around the system, but it just gives us more tools in our, our toolkit. I think that's only going to increase as the demand for these products increases. Because uh, it's pretty low right now. There aren't that many projects that, that involve uh, those types of systems. And, and you know, that's the reason that you know, the Japanese manufacturers haven't brought more of the products to market, is they don't feel that there's enough demand in the North American market yet. I think that's something that we're going to see change. So I'm, I'm excited as a designer that, you know, the options of that will open up for us and, and only bring down costs over time. I just Whoops. Uh, uh, would like to ask you about um, how you deal with corporations where the philosophy is they don't think of the present value of the future cash flow out. Which, you know, as you get more and more regulations, you're going to have that cost a long way. But they're almost always in America, at least uh, on a short term basis, it's short term profits short-term planning, and if you show them, you know, look at the present value of future gas flow, you can make a very good case. Yeah. Because to say that carbon fuel is cheaper is ridiculous. It isn't when you think of the long-term costs of it. Yeah. So how do you deal with that? <laughs> Regulation. <laughs> I mean, the so you, you don't Ooh. deal with corporations? And yeah, I mean, we deal with corporations. But you know, we deal with ones that are progressive. And, and the, I mean, right now, this is still a very much a leader's market. I mean, this this is not a mainstream conversation that we would be having with a company that's prioritizing you know, short-term profits, for example. Yeah, what I'm getting to is that probably ninety percent of all big corporations, everything is based on short-term results. The stock market, you know. Is the president of the company gets more because the stock market price goes up this year and so forth. Their bonus is based on that. So their whole thinking is not based on long term cash flow. Quarter baked thinking, you always call that. They're yeah, always right. looking at the quarter instead of. Everybody else looks at a five-year term. Year, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I want to hop in here real quick and say something that I think is a bit encouraging, which I think a lot of these corporations now are realizing that their brand. Is sort of dependent on them being more sustainable, more energy uh, focused. And I know from our experience, we've had corporations that did stuff, but then they advertised that they were doing it because it made their tenants happier. So I mean, I think there might be hope in that regard. But you look at what the president's golden parachute is usually based on, you know, the a couple of years. Yeah, yeah, but but brand is so important, and especially with the younger generation, I think they're so conscious of this. And I know that building owners that we deal with uh, in Atlanta, 
realize that they're built to, they're going to have people come into the building to be there it better be sustainable and it better be smart because the millennials are not going to come in and work in a place that's that's not now, there are corporations to your point that haven't they hadn't quite caught up with them yet the very large ones. yes yeah. Yeah. but City like you know, New York City is, is another leader in terms of uh, regulation on climate, and, and they've you know they've established pretty strict greenhouse gas emissions targets for buildings. Because um, you, you think about a, a lot of emissions are coming from apartment buildings, and they, like you know no amount of, of pressure is going to get an apartment building owner to decarbonize their building. I don't think unless. You know, they're, they're required to. I'll say the, the requirements are huge in getting people to do the right thing. Um, so, I, I mean, I've worked in residential property management and now energy efficiency my whole life, it seems. And building owners at the, at the city level, uh, small and medium players, just don't care if it's not going to make money. So what's, what, what Washington, D.C., where I live, has done is said, any building that's 50,000 square feet or greater has to make efficiency targets of X, and they're stepping that down over five years to 10,000 square feet or greater. And the idea is that if they don't do this, it's going to cost them money. So it helps them to quantify the business case for efficiency. And again, it takes, it takes the municipality or the city or the state like Washington saying that these companies do it or else. And, but they will do it if, if, if it impacts the bottom line and, enough. And I think you can certainly debate that you know, some, some ways of regulating it are more effective and efficient than others. And I'm, I'm sure that's something that hopefully organizations, as they try these things, will learn what works and what doesn't. But I think, yeah, there's a piece of the market that is always going to be there unless it is regulated. I just want to kind of pull on a few things that have been talked about right now. Um, with this idea of the conversation we're having here in North America, like I'm part of the millennial generation, and what you said makes sense. I want to work somewhere that's striving to meet these new goals, and if they're not, then I don't want to be there. I want to see these incentives in place and give me a reason to have hope for that company and the future. Um, but the conversation here in North America is we're striving to get towards carbon zero, which is awesome. But the conversation in like Netherlands and in Germany, they're already going carbon negative, like they're ahead of us. So what what I want to hear your thoughts and opinions on why there's so much more resistance to this change in North America than there is in Europe. We spend more carbon than they do. <laughs> I think it's and also they're as a society, they're they they basically they travel by trains, they live in apartments, they they live in they live way more you know using a lot less carbon per person than we do in fact i just uh was a linkedin or a twitter feed came across and it actually was a an array of all of the uh, carbon use per capita uh and it was an interesting just like a big pinwheel showing all of the countries so i think i think what what's happened uh carbon has been more expensive in europe one big problem with North America is carbon is dirt cheap, incredibly, you know, and, and we're always we're always fighting that. We, you know, the drive, we got half the people trying to drive the gas price down, and the other half think it should go up. Uh, and whether and it's the same thing with you know coal or heating. So we have all of these incredibly low cost uh, carbon sources, and then to couple that up, we have gigantic spaces that we travel between. We have houses that are half acre versus uh, a 600 square foot house in uh, in Europe uh, you know so we have all of these other adjuncts and I think it, there's a the lifestyle change that is required is is a is another uh, you know another situation that kind of kind of holds it up you know I mean I actually I think the discussion in North America will go to mm -hmm carbon negative buildings in the next few years. Like I, I actually just, you know, how fast the whole net zero thing has caught on. I mean, even five years ago, that was kind of a radical idea. Um, you know, now I would say it's, it's more or less accepted, at least in the, you know, our portion of the, the 
the design and, and construction community that, that you know that's achievable. It's not any radical thing. So I, I would guess that within five years you'll hear a lot more talk about carbon negative construction and that being a much more accepted idea than. I just don't think we've got around to having that discussion yet. So I think you know, Europe, Europe is kind of where that idea started. And it seems to be once they've, I mean, they get more, basically the business cases for all of this investment are better in Europe because they pay so much more for energy. That is energy-based investments make a lot more sense there. Um, so that's why, I think all, I, that's at least in my opinion, why they've always kind of led us there. But I think those ideas will eventually come here. I think it was, yeah, probably within so have, have hope. Yeah. <laughs> I think we'll get there. Um, you know, we just, we just need a little longer. I think that, that I don't think that I don't disagree with either. I think those are very practical reasons. But I think there's also the elephant in the room of how politicized the science has become. And I think that in the U.S., at least in the current state of, of affairs and the near term, the only way we'll see dramatic change is if the narrative changes. The opportunity for efficiency alone, energy efficiency alone, beyond some of the more aggressive climate-focused strategies, is significant. And you can tell an incredibly compelling story of investment energy efficiency that has bottom-line benefits. You don't have to say carbon. You don't have to say efficiency. And if that's the way to change the mind of some folks that have a lot of power, the dollars matter. And I think that, unfortunately, that's it's a completely different dialogue. Um, but I think there is a groundswell your generation, an entire population demanding people pay attention. That political climate, I think, can't be ignored. But I think there's also a matter of just from a pragmatic standpoint, if that doesn't change, that significant change can happen if the narrative. So how do you tell that story? What's the compelling piece? There's a technology story here. There's a technology play. You improve my experience in this building just from my experience. That's a compelling story. I individually may have a really strong um, feeling that I want that to be prioritized, wrapped in the story around climate, but it also could just be the financial. So I think part of it too is just the way in which those um, narratives are coming to play. I'd, I'd like to point back to price, though, because uh, if we take an example like Hawaii, which is basically, uh, you know, used to generate much of their energy by burning fuel oil that was uh, that was uh, brought in by boat. And they've started to move into you know more and more renewable solar farms and stuff, and they've got a, a big percentage. But what's driving that is it's like 25 cents a kilowatt for power in Hawaii, and it's like I don't know seven, eight, nine, ten cents, depending on where you are in the country. So we have this incredibly low cost, and then where we have nuclear plants, it even gets crazier. Where we get down to some of this. Uh, the one I always love is the megawatts, where it actually when it flips. Uh, they actually they can't shut down the nuclear plant, so they have to get rid of the power, so they spool it off to the nearest, uh, the nearest utility. So we get these opportunities of extreme low energy costs. Uh, the nuclear probably wasn't a good example because it's not at least not uh, generating uh, carbon. But it, I, I think there is a problem there uh, that, that is kind of vested in America and Canada as well as just our low a low cost of carbon, and we don't we don't pre really price it properly because we don't have a uh, we don't put a value on the fact that when we burn carbon we cause some problems. Yeah, and I think you know, the clients that we have that are most progressive in tackling this have decided that they internally are going to have a price for carbon for their projects, and we we actually have a government carbon tax in, in BC as well. It's like and, and actually the rest of Canada now it's like fifty bucks a ton. That's actually not really enough to drive any significant changes. It, 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 it can have a small impact on some of the energy efficiency projects, but it, you know, it's not enough to give someone an incentive to totally convert their building over from, say, a boiler system to a heat pump system. So you really have to be up in the $150, $200 a ton range. And I think just politically, most places are not there yet. Um, eventually we'll get there, but, but that, that's the I still think the carbon tax is a great tool for because it gives you a way to monetize that and, and build it into you know, your normal business cases that, that you build. But um, and it starts some great, great discussions, discussions with, with the naysayers, naysayers too. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, without, yeah, without that, that kind of price signal, it's then you're, you're trying to make a, a more abstract argument. I think that's a lot harder. Okay. Any other questions, comments? We want to jump in. Uh, 
uh, and I'm not suggesting that that's a, a solution, but you know, it's like giving people saying something that, you, here's something that you'll get. You'll get a, you know, you'll get this plaque, you know, give you all this yeah. additional, additional stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it can be a, a selling point. Our, our clients typically say, well, we don't want the plaque. <laughs> we want to leave like buildings, and even the government, the federal government is, is that way too. So it's kind of, but it, but it did serve a good purpose, and that kind of helped to bring us forward. Uh, and so I'm not saying that that's a solution, but it's in, if you can offer something mm -hmm. like that, you know, some something to. Uh, we meet this particular carbon goal. Is that what you're suggesting? Like, like we put on the front door of the building that this uh, this is oh, yeah. below X. Yeah, carbon neutral. Have you seen anything like that, Brad? Uh, of, of giving them the kudos. Yeah, for the work that they're, for the money you're spending, because that's what it takes more money to engineer it. It takes more money to build it. And, and it's going to cost more money to maintain it. So, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a good thing. They may not see the return directly back to the corporation, but in the society as a whole, they will, which that's probably part of the problem. That people look very, very small at things rather than looking at the macro. Mm -hmm. I think there's an opportunity to roll that in at the transaction point. So from a real estate transaction perspective, there's there certain, I think the UK and a few other places, there's a disclosure law where at the point of selling a building, you have to disclose the energy profile of that building. And that I think is compelling because then all of a sudden there's the financial implication. If you have two like buildings um, that are being on the market, that are being sold, there's a there's an element of transparency there. I, I, yeah, I think the carbon piece is interesting. I think well is getting at least we're hearing more about well, so it's another dimension. I think it, it becomes a question like, is it a pay to play to have this, you know, how to have this, this bad that ends up making us out? Yeah. Which I think is leading to some challenges. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we're seeing you know, some jurisdic jurisdictions look at, like, yeah, as you said, like building labeling, building benchmarking. So, yeah, having, and I, I think that, that certainly can be a piece of it. And I know. We are British Columbia is now looking at voluntary benchmarking, which is a start. Um, and then down the road, that might lead to more yeah, mandatory benchmarking or disclosure, or, you know, some way to put a label on on these low carbon buildings. But yeah, I think that would be, you know, if I had a client that invested, you know, two million bucks in making their building zero carbon, um, yeah, I think they should get some kudos for that. Because <laughs> um, you know they can get some benefit, you know, marketing or otherwise out of it that, that is uh, adds to their reasons for doing it, it can only help. So I think it's a great, it's a great idea. And I think the science-based targets might start to roll. The, the science-based target initiative where companies are going in and, and promoting their commitments, um, that rolls up with their portfolio as well and helps the companies do it. To the best of our knowledge, is anybody doing that as part of their climate emergency plan? Uh, Coming up with uh, the goals. Uh, uh, yeah. 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 Is that a technical target? Yeah, I think so. Let me see. Uh, do you know? Can, can you confirm that? Uh, they, they have building level targets for very large buildings. I think there's a handful of efficiency targets. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the target is. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, it's interesting. <laughs> okay. We've done it again. We start talking. To, we, we stop talking when the people start leaving the room. So we, uh, we, we, we must be done. Uh, actually, uh, 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 Kim, who runs this, she told us this story. She's she's a math math nerd, and she said that when her math teacher told us that when you're talking about math, you you start and you got everybody following you, and then you move up, and then there's only you know 20 percent following. And said so you're finished when you're finally just talking to yourself. So I think we're very close to that. Anyway, thank you very much for coming. It's uh, an interesting topic, uh, and thank you for sharing it with us.